Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rory de Burka. I'm the um, Director General of uh, Development Cooperation in Africa Division. Um, and uh, it's, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you all for this uh, discussion that we're going to have on, on food diplomacy. Um, this session is being recorded. So uh, just, just so everybody knows, uh, that's for internal purposes, but um, just it is going to be recorded. I'm joined today by, by two people that uh, I'm delighted uh, to have with us, um, Tom Arnold and Sinead McPhillips. Uh, many of you know both of them. Um, but for those that don't, uh, Tom is currently the chair of the uh, 2030 Agri-Food Strategy Committee um, that uh, the government have, have, have established to, to, to look at uh, exactly that, our Agri-Food Strategy to 2030. He's also the government's special envoy for food systems, um, the first person to be appointed to such a role in the European Union. Uh, he's a member of the Champions Network for the U UN Food Systems Summit that will take place next September. Uh, and I think that Food Systems Summit is one of the reasons why we thought it'd be useful to have our discussion today. A uh, member of many other high-level panels. Uh, he's been a coordinator of the Scouting Up Nutrition Movement, which I think is also very relevant to the discussion we're going to have today. Uh, Director General of the Institute for International and European Affairs, where everybody in DFA goes after they retire. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, Tom is, is what your future looks like. Uh, he was chair of the Irish Constitutional Convention, uh, chief executive concerned worldwide, um, chair of the OECD Committee on Agriculture, and chief economist and assistant secretary general in the Department of Agriculture and Food. Uh, he's also an agricultural economist uh, and uh, has a number of master's degrees. Um, so, so really, really impressive CV. Um, he, he, we're also joined by Sinead McPhillips, who in that linear line of succession has taken over from Tom as uh, Assistant Secretary General uh, and, and has also been Chief Economist in the Department of uh, Agriculture, Food and, then Mar and, and Marine. Um, and in that role, she uh, not alone stands on the shoulders of a, of a giant or a number of giants, uh, because Anne Derwin is our ambassador in, in Beijing, also served in that role, but she leads an agri-food sector of policy and strategy development uh, for her department. And that, you know, requires her to, to lead on the policy for the meat and dairy sectors, dairy product controls and certification, food and drinks industry development, agri-food sectoral and strategic planning, economic analysis to inform policy making, and input international agriculture policy and development cooperation. And in that last regard, you know, Sinead uh, and her team have been really, really strong uh, collaborators with, with my team in, in, in DCD uh, and, and it's been really valuable as we try to, to shape the development cooperation response to, to food and hunger and, and, and other issues and we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, you know, Sinead uh, uh, has a, a master's in economic science uh, and also has a BA in public administration. And it's great to have both of you here today to, 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 to start a discussion on food diplomacy. And, you know, food diplomacy is not a term that we've tended to use. Uh, and I thought it'd be useful, maybe before I invited both of you to speak, to that we maybe, I might just give a, a little, just a few thoughts on, on what it might mean. And I think we'll tease it out further over the course of the, uh, of the session. Uh, we'd like this to be as interactive as... Uh, discussions over uh, any electronic platform can be. Um, that's why we have Slido uh, uh, for, for you all to use. Um, it's slido.com, hashtag food systems. We've sent around the details in advance. And, and just to get people thinking about food systems, we've, we've set up a very quick and, and, and dirty uh, sort of uh, Slido poll. So while, while I'm thinking and talking through a bit about food diplomacy, maybe you could all uh, Think about, you know, what aspect of food diplomacy is it important for Ireland uh, to prioritise? And we've given you five options because three is traditional and four is kind of boring. So five just to really, really get the, get the minds going. So the first option, you know, is food diplomacy A, promoting Ireland as a food island? Is it B, about further developing markets, markets for Irish agri-food exports? Is it C, sharing our agri-food system expertise and experiences with other countries. 
Is it D, supports to Irish agri-food business? Or E, maintaining our strong voice and supporting action towards zero hunger? So can I ask you all, to, to as, 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 we're, as we're talking, to, to maybe engage a little bit with those questions and, and we'll see where we think the balance falls amongst all of those options. There's no trick option. There's no wrong option. So please engage. And can I ask you also maybe as you're, as you're registering to, to use your name because we will be trying to invite you to ask questions later on and I will prioritise people who identify themselves uh, uh, because I think out of fairness to us all, it's better that we know who's asking the question and, and we know who's, who's, who's on the call. And we have 200 people registered, so there's a lot of people. So it would be really nice to, to, to get some of those, those, those voices. Um, so what is food diplomacy? You know, food has always been part of diplomacy. You know, many of you have probably heard the phrase dining for Ireland, uh, you know, gathering people around the table, pulling us in for a chat, you know, using all of the senses to, to sort of bend people uh, to, to our, our will. You know, Talleyrand, before he went off uh, uh, to an international conference, said, said, to, said to the, the Emperor of France, I need saucepans, not questions, which was an interesting, you know, sort of insight into uh, 18th century diplomacy. And Oscar Wilde, uh, a man without whom uh, no conversation is, 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 you know, is ever really uh, complete, said to make a to make a good salad is to be like a good diplomatist. You know, you know, the, the problem is the same. You know, it's to know, it's know how much oil to how much vinegar you need to get to where you want. And, and, and there's a bit of that, I think. Uh, you know, food food is, is is in many ways a lubricant of diplomacy. Uh, and I think for Irish diplomacy, it's also, you know, it's very much part of our, how we express ourselves and our values, how we think of ourselves as a nation and how we project ourselves uh, externally. You, you know, we, we do put weight on the experience of famine uh, uh, as an island. Um, and, um, you know, in many ways that forms us, it shapes our demographics to, to this day. We're still the only country in Western Europe this population is less than it was in 1800. It shaped many of our social attitudes and, and probably some of the things that have changed in our society over the last decade, you know, were themselves the product of the kind of social shock that, that we had because of the shortage of food and the questions around land and land division that, that, that flowed from, from the famine. And, you know, we bring that to our diplomacy. So today at the Security Council, there's a discussion on on Ethiopia, in Tigray, which is at what's called IPC level five, effectively famine. And one of the things we will be saying at the Security Council today is this isn't good enough. And one of the reasons why we think we have the moral authority to call it is because of our own folk memory of famine. That's also one of the reasons why about 15 years ago we started the Hunger Task Force, which was uh, a way of putting hunger on the international agenda uh, uh, you know, to address uh, the continuing shortages of food in the world. Uh, and that was a really big part of our diplomacy at that time. And Tom will probably pick up a little bit uh, on, on some of the outworkings of that hunger, that hunger task force, hunger agenda, uh, in, in what he said. But that's really influenced an awful lot of how we think about investing our development aid. And we, through a better world, the new white paper that we produced two years ago, we tried to update the hunger agenda with a more positive word, which is food, um, and have a food agenda. And one of the reasons why the government asked Tom to be our envoy uh, on food is because we want to, to talk about food and link it back to domestic change on food. Uh, and this is probably where I think what Sinead will tell us is interesting, the kind of thinking that's going on around our own food systems in Ireland and how we link you know, our response to climate change, to our response to, to agricultural food production, is giving rise to some really interesting but also difficult questions for us that, that we need to bring into, into our diplomacy and how we talk about our island, how we sell our island, how we sell our produce, but also to listen and learn from others and bring it back. Um, because ultimately we are a food island. You know, food is at the heart of our economy. We export 11 times more food than we can eat ourselves, which is a great achievement. Um, and that comes with a, with, with, a, with a responsibility to our farming sector, to how we use our land. 
uh, but it also gives us a great opportunity to, to be really effective and efficient uh, farmers. And I don't think it's any accident that, the, that, that it was concern for the farming sector uh, uh, that was at the heart of our decision to join the EU. You know, the access to the cap, access to EU markets was a really big part of that decision in 1973. And I think, you know, it, it, it's fair to say that the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine is always in one of the more outward looking departments uh, that we have. There's, uh, you know, currently 12 agricultural attaches, staff members of, of the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine in, in Irish embassies around the world from Latin America to Asia, obviously Europe, uh, the US, you know, and, and, and who knows, maybe at some time to come in Africa as well. And I think that's a really interesting statement of, of just how intertwined questions around agriculture, around food, are with our broader diplomacy. And we had a really strong reminder of that at the weekend when, you know, when the G7 met, the discussion was of sausage wars and trade barriers. And, you know, an awful lot of our diplomacy over the last number of years, while we've talked about it maybe in a Brexit frame or a Brexit lens, has been about market access for our agricultural products. It's been about the kind of, you know, the phytosanitary and other protections that we need to have as an island to, 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 to make, it, make our food or to continue to make sure our food is safe. And I think as we look forward to a decade where our climate is going to be stressed, where we are going to be asked to do more on climate diplomacy, food will have to be at the heart of that. We have to understand how, how others are engaging with stresses and strains in their food systems, see how we can maybe share our knowledge. Also, look for markets. You know, we, we're coming out of a, a difficult period now. Brexit is changing the kind of markets for our, our agricultural products. So, again, we are going to have to have food at the centre of our recovery, but not in a foolish way. We can't, we can't chase every opportunity. We have to be strategic. You know, we have to listen to, to Board B, we have to listen to our colleagues in, in the Department of Agriculture and make sure we're chasing after the right targets at the right time. Uh, and I think it'd be interesting to hear what Sinead has to say around that. Um, and I think there are real opportunities for us to have food and food questions in our multilateral diplomacy. And we have two really big appointments with ourselves coming up this year. First is the Food Systems Summit that I mentioned earlier on, which takes place uh, uh, in New York, um, we don't know yet whether it will be virtual or, or in person, uh, in September, uh, and, and the road to that. And Tom might pick up some of the discussion on that uh, in terms of his envoy role. But that's when the world talks about integrating food into our broader thinking. So food and health, food and welfare, you know, making sure that we produce food in sustainable ways. It's a really important conference. And I think some of the thinking that's been going on in the Department of Agriculture about a food systems approach in Ireland is, is, you know, is really interesting and will be really interesting after, after that food system summit, acknowledging that it's asking hard questions of, of the sector, not all of which have been resolved yet uh, as well. And I think sometimes it's in asking and answering those hard questions that the biggest learning is and maybe there's something there that in time we can share. Um, then there's a Nutrition for Growth Summit uh, in uh, December as well, kind of hot on the heels of, of the COP discussions. And ultimately, in any uh, discussion on food, nutrition has to be at the heart of it. Good nutrition, you know, is, is what gives good kids the prospect of good education, of growing up to be healthy, productive adults. Really, really important. And we're having both of these discussions at a time when more people are hungry than have been hungry for the last 20 years, where we have the prospects of, of a famine for the first time in 20 years, uh, and where the real strains uh, to, to global food production systems, partly because of the pandemic, and we can't negate that, uh, partly because of climate change, uh, and partly because of, of poor distribution of knowledge. And I'll finish with this and say that Tom, Tom has been really helpful to both Sinead and I in, in leading a process uh, uh, um, to, to, enable, to enable us to work with Irish business, with Irish academics, you know, with, uh, uh, with, with the Irish NGO sector to bring together a, a combined offer of Ireland uh, to share with, 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 with potential uh, people of interest in, in Africa. And we hope to take that forward 
later on this year. It's been a really important piece of work to make sure that the Irish food offer is at the heart of, of our diplomacy uh, in Africa as well. So there's a, there's a huge agenda, um, and I think our challenge is probably to try and pull it together. Probably up to now, we've, we've talked about you know, food and food diplomacy in maybe a siloed way, you know, different streams. And I think the challenge over the next few years is to try and be, more, be as integrated as we can be while respecting also all the different mandates that are at play. So with that, uh, Tom, I, I, I might bring you in uh, and I'd ask you all to, to think about answering um, the, the survey, uh, you know, and, uh, and also to think about some questions uh, for Tom and Sinead. So, Tom, over to you. Rory, really, th thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with both of you today. Um, I'm going to start maybe by following up on your quotations because I was also uh, looking up about this topic of food diplomacy and what it meant. And I came across one rather interesting one. It, it talked about well, if diplomacy is about winning hearts and minds, uh, this quotation said, that, well, the basic premise of food diplomacy is that, quote, the easiest way to win hearts and minds is through the stomach. I thought this was a very good starting point. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a real honor to have been appointed as um, special envoy on food systems. I didn't realize it, but that I'd been probably serving an apprenticeship for this for the last 50 years without realizing it. Uh, because what my work has involved over the years, three major themes around food and agriculture, uh, around Europe and around Africa. And here at this point, uh, in this role of special envoy, these three themes are actually all going to be interconnected. And I do think that it's a very good moment for Ireland to embark on a more conscious approach towards food diplomacy, which for me, just in simple terms, means that food is put close to the heart of Irish foreign and economic policy. It's always there in terms of economic policy, in terms of political, the, the, the foreign policy, uh, less so. But I think now moving in that direction. And it's appropriate for two reasons. Firstly, it's because that's the way the world is going at the moment. And secondly, we have, over the course of the last year and a half, been working on a national agri-food strategy that you mentioned, the 2030 agri-food strategy, which, in my view, is going to connect very powerfully to the evolving international strategy. So when we look at the international situation, I think the last 10 decade in particular has seen a, a, a dawning a realization that food uh, in its different forms is of central importance to policy. It's of central importance to the realization of the strategic uh, development goals for, for 2030. And it, it has also been realized that food and how it's produced directly connects to two critically important areas, the area of the environment and the area of health. In connecting with the environment, the, se the food sector is obviously generating uh, environmental uh, challenges in terms of the increased emissions, water quality, biodiversity issues. Food has to be produced in a way that in the future minimizes that environmental footprint. And on the other hand, the environment, it, it, because of its, uh, the impacts of climate change, is impacting on the food sector. And all of this then against the challenge of how the world is going to feed uh, nearly 10 billion people over the next, by 2050. So that's a hugely important central challenge that the world is facing. And uh, the, the Food System Summit is just one reflection of this. But as you said, there are other meetings. So the interconnectedness of these major meetings coming up over the next number of months, uh, the Food System Summit in September. There's another one which wasn't mentioned and which doesn't get as much attention, but needs to get attention. <clears throat> There's a UN conference on biodiversity in, in, in October. Then you've got COP26 in November. 
and you've got the Nutrition for Growth Summit in December. Now, that's the international dimension. So how does this fit with the domestic uh, agenda here? And critically, it is uh, it, th that connection is really in terms of the 2030 agri-food strategy. This was a committee set up by the government in November 2019, just before uh, COVID. Uh, and it's the fifth such grouping since 2000 in terms of framing Ireland's agri-food strategy. But this one is different, I would submit. It's different in the sense that we were given as our central purpose that we had to provide a vision for the future of the sector and policies to go along with that vision, which would enable sustainability to be the center core of, uh, of the sector over the next decade. Sustainability in its three dimensions, economic, environmental, and social. And that's what we have attempted, we have attempted to do in the strategy. And we have set out as a core objective, the central objective of our policy over the next decade is that Ireland should become a leader in sustainable food systems over the next decade. And we believe that we have set out a, a coherent policy framework to achieve that. Where we're at is we today, in fact, literally 20 minutes ago, was the end of the public consultation period for the draft strategy that we produced in April. Uh, we will now take on board what will have been submitted during that public consultation period, what was uh, heard during the national food dialogues, four of which were held over April and May, in which Sinead was the convener. We will take those, that, the, the messages from both of those processes and finalize the food strategy uh, for, the, for and do that hopefully by early July. So that's, if you like, our starting point. I think what we have to offer uh, with this strategy is a message of great relevance to the wider world, because we, we are saying that sustainability of, of agri-food sector has to be at the heart of our policy. We're setting ourselves a really substantial ambition to be a leader in that. And we will want to bring that experience both of drawing up the strategy and of advocating for sustainable food systems. We want to bring that message to the various meetings that will be held over the coming, uh, the coming number of months. I'd stop there because I think, as you said, Rory, we want to get this into an interactive conversation, but that at least is a starting point. No, thanks, Tom. I mean, and I think, and, and thank you, by the way, for for um, for reminding us about the UN Convention on uh, on biodiversity and the conference, because I think, yeah, you're right. That is that is very much woven into I think those international events that we have to go, and that sense too of of, of health and the environment being inter interconnected with with food. Uh, really, really important. Um, Sinead, just moving to you, I mean, I'd be really interested in your perspectives on this idea of food diplomacy um, um, and also just how that impacts on, 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 on the work of, of, of your department uh, and, and not just your department, but the agencies that you have. Um, you know, and also you, you've been, the, you were the convener of, of, of the National Food Systems Summit Dialogues that, that took place last month as well. I mean, how they, they feed in and out of us, was that outward looking mandate, but also that more maybe inward looking conversation. Uh, and also any thoughts you have maybe just, just to maybe stimulate questions and, uh, and whatever from our colleagues, but just how can, how can DFA and, and the embassy network, particularly those embassies that maybe don't have an attaché, best support you uh, uh, in, in your work uh, as well. But, you know, they're just to, to prompt discussion. I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to fill in the, fill in the gaps as well. So over to you, Sinead. Thanks very much, Rory, and it's a pleasure to be here. I suppose to, to follow on from Tom's remarks, the, the only quote that occurs to me is one from Ian e. Forster, which is only connect. Uh, so it's really about connecting all of these policies. We've talked a lot and we've talked over, over the past 25 years that I've been involved uh, about uh, policy coherence, particularly in terms of, of trade and development. And really now I think we're at the point of, of talking about policy integration, integrated policy approaches to, to food and health, food and the environment, trade and development and so on. And really I think that our experience in terms of Brexit and in terms of COVID, the big challenges 
uh, that we faced over the last few years has really taught us that lesson that there's no there's no silos, no room for silos anymore. We need integrated approaches. And it's very difficult, I think, to recognize that for civil servants, that that we're we're more comfortable having responsibility for a policy and then obviously collaborating across departments, which I think our, our two departments do exceptionally well, but to have an integrated policy approach. As mentioned, the need to integrate our, our national policy and our international policy focus. Uh, there's huge areas of overlap and coherence there, but, but it is a challenge for the future. Um, just in terms of the, of the five questions that were answered there on Slido, I think I'd have to say all of those uh, options are priorities for, for, for this department uh, and are all being advanced. And I suppose just to, just to touch on, on some of the ways that we are doing that, uh, along with our agencies and, and the Embassy Network. So in terms of, of market development, agri-food exports have increased in value by over 60% over the last decade. And the 2030 strategy has an ambition to grow that value again by a further 50% to 21 billion by 2030. And that is going to be a, a challenging target because that is really, rather than adding va volume as we have over the last decade, the focus will be on adding value added on getting to premium markets for, for premium products. Um, there's a range of, of initiatives that, that we follow in terms of advancing that market development agenda. Obviously, we're closely following EU free trade agreements uh, and seeing opportunities and challenges there. Uh, in terms of accessing markets, uh, my department does detailed market access negotiations with international partners. And the embassy network plays a huge role in that, in, in terms of advancing questionnaires, arranging meetings, technical meetings, and so on. Um, Board BIA have a very significant role in terms of marketing and promotion. And really what we've done over the last few years is to integrate all of those threads, I think, uh, to the best of our ability, to, um, to open as many routes to market as possible uh, through market access agreements, market development, and then supporting the sector to avail of those opportunities. We, as Rory, as you said, I mean, we export food and drink to 180 countries around the world. So we need to prioritize. We can't, we can't prioritize everywhere. That just, that just makes it meaningless. Um, the embassy network, as I said, plays a vital role in all of this work. We have our agricultural attaches in key markets and have, have stepped that up in recent years working with other embassy staff and with Board BIA. The market development work and the market access work involves ministerial trade missions, technical visits, inward visits to Ireland, audits and inspections. And obviously COVID has had an enormous impact on that, on that work. And it's made the role of the embassies in market more important than ever. We have developed along with Board BIA a system of, of virtual trade missions. And that's been very important in terms of ensuring that there's still government interaction with key business partners. I suppose uh, we, we have that with our minister, the department, Board BIA, the local embassy team, engage with businesses and inter do introductions for Irish businesses. The downside, I suppose, of the, that virtual interaction is that it's very difficult to get that at government level. Um, we've had some successful engagements, but competent authorities in, in some key markets are very reluctant to engage online, and that's understandable. And again, that makes the role of the Irish Embassy more important than ever. The, another thread, obviously, of, of food diplomacy, I would see, is, is development cooperation. And we've always had that, uh, that lead role in terms of engagement with two of the Rome-based agencies, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Programme. And again, we've tried to, to look at that in a more strategic way over the last few years to, uh, to manage those relationships through strategic partnership agree agreements with those agencies. And that is done in close collaboration with the Department of Foreign Affairs and with the Rome Embassy. I suppose in terms of Africa in particular, we see opportunities for, for both trade and development cooperation and knowledge transfer. We have our shared uh, Africa Agri-Food Development Programme 
which helps Irish companies to to partner with African partners. Uh, Rory, you've mentioned the uh, the Ireland Africa Rural Development Committee that we'll be setting up as a response to the National Task Team on, on Rural Africa. So there's a, there's a huge amount of work there. Um, the third uh, thread I would see is, is transferring agri-food expertise to partners internationally. And this is something there's been a huge interest in because there is a recognition that Ireland is a very good ecosystem in terms of uh, research innovation um, and, and systems and government involvement in, in, in uh, the agri-food sector. So we have a, a consortium which is called Sustainable Food Systems Ireland and that uh, offers the expertise of Ireland's government agri-food organisations internationally on a fee basis to help partner countries to strengthen food security, sustainability, productivity, food safety. So this department, Borbia, Chagask, Food Safety Authority and Enterprise Ireland are part of that consortium. And I think that's working well. And I think it's accepted by, um, by partners as an, as an offering that's not um, dictating to, to them as to what they should do. It's, it's giving an explanation of what, what our, the approach Ireland has taken and suggesting it as an offering. And I think that's, that's something that we're bringing to the UN Food Systems Summit as well in terms of the, the game changer that we have suggested, which is really about helping other countries to plan strategies to, to meet those big challenges, taking a food systems approach. As Thomas said, we have our own example. We're not holding ourselves up as a paragon of food systems by any means or saying we've solved all those problems. But I think that's, that's, that's an approach that is generally um, works well for Ireland. That, we're partners and, and we have examples that can be useful. Uh, so I'm sure you had other questions there, but, uh, but I might stop talking at that point. Thanks. No, thanks, Sinead. Um, um, there's, there's an awful lot in what you said. I mean, I think that question of integration that you started off with, I mean, in fact, we've been challenged to integrate better by the, the new civil service renewal strategy. I went off to pick up a copy just, just um, but that does talk about that need for us, I think, to be a more integrated civil service to respond to the, the challenges of the decade ahead. And, and, and I've been reflecting that, you know, what we used to think about as problems to be dealt with at home or problems to be dealt with abroad are much more integrated and require solutions that are looking both in both directions at once, I think. Uh, the world is a more integrated and complicated place. And I think that requires us as a civil service to work in a more integrated and complex way with each other in a spirit of, of, of really effective partnership. And I think the challenge then is to understand as best we can those relative, the relative strengths that everybody brings so that we're, we're right-sizing the, the various engagements. Uh, and I think we have some really good examples in how we've worked together uh, as departments, but we can still, I think, improve on that. And I think today's discussion uh, is an opportunity for us to, to bring out that, that um that conversation and you know the experiment in, in virtual trade missions I think is a really interesting one because I think it's part of that virtual diplomacy in the broader sense that we've all been working with maybe struggling with at times as well uh, and I think there's some real opportunities for us to to share what's worked and what's not worked you know you lose something you know going back to maybe uh, you know Tom's Tom's quote about about the, you know the way to people's hearts is through their stomach or I'm paraphrasing but you know that the, the being together, the breaking bread, and the sharing of experiences together is is a very powerful thing, and virtual diplomacy is is less powerful, unfortunately, but it's much more powerful than not having any. I think there's a lot there we can lean in, um, and I'm struck by the ecosystem point that you, that you mentioned. I mean, and I think I think many of us have seen that different elements of it. You know, I don't know that. Uh, you know, we, we all necessarily see all of it all of the time. But, you know, where I've seen, S, you know, S, uh, Sustainable Food Systems Ireland engage, for example, in Kenya around around potatoes has been really, really interesting and exciting. And I know uh, that they've done some really interesting work in the Middle East as well. And I think there's bits about learning from that and leaning in. But I'm also conscious, uh, you know, of, of not overloading systems too. You know, and I think we have, a, you know, sort of, I'm conscious that sometimes as a department we might go into the constituent parts directly 
rather than going through SFSI. And I think that's something we need to, to maybe reflect on and be a little bit more disciplined in, in our approach so that we pick up that point of suppose, the scarcity value of skills or, or, or of time and attention. And we maximize that through the strategic deployment of, of resources that David Butler and his team in, in Sustainable Food Systems Ireland can deploy and are designed to, to employ. I might feed back the, um, the results of the poll. And as you said, Sinead, you know, they, they were all important. And the problem with a poll like this is we also, by asking, giving five options, we suggest that there are only five options. There are probably many more. But it was just interesting that the 100 people responded to the poll. So I, I don't know what the margin for error was on that, but uh, interesting, 39%. So 39 people thought that sharing our agri-food system expertise and experiences with other countries was, was or should be our priority. 32%, 32 people thought maintaining our strong voice in supporting action towards zero hunger. They probably all work in this division. Um, uh, so why is there only 32 of you answering that question uh, or prioritizing that? It's my question. Promoting Ireland as a food island, this is probably our colleagues in the Department of Agriculture, 14, so that's 12 agricultural attaches plus two. Uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, promoting Ireland as a food island. Further developing markets for Irish agri-food exports, 10%. And supports to agri Irish agri-food businesses, 5%. So just interesting questions uh, for us to reflect on about what we need to prioritise or how we see our mission today moving forward. Um, we have a number of questions that uh, are beginning to come in, and please please ask, ask, ask questions. Um, I have a question from, from Paul Kiernan. I don't know, Paul, if you can unmute and ask the question yourself. Um, uh, I can't see you, so you might have to speak up to let me know you're, you're, you're there. But, Paul, if you could unmute and ask the question, uh, please do. Otherwise, I'm happy to ask it on your behalf. Paul is the attache uh, to the, the Rome-based agencies that Sinead mentioned. I'm going to assume, Paul, that you're not able to, 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 to get access to the technology. So if you don't mind, um, I'm going to ask your question uh, for you. Uh, and to, Paul is asking uh, both Tom and Sinead. Sinead, as convener of the National Food Systems Dialogues, and Tom, as you know, uh, your role as a food systems summit champion, you know, you're both very aware of Ireland's strong support for the UN Food Systems Summit. Um, Paul references the two game-changing solutions, uh, which I think also Sinead has touched on. You know, the support facility to help countries take practical steps to transform their food systems, and one in resetting wasting. You know, and and he asks. What role can these two game-changing solutions play in food diplomacy? And, and Tom, particularly to you, uh, how can you, as our special envoy in food systems, and then the broader embassy network, work together to drive these two solutions? So maybe first to you, Tom, and then maybe to Sinead, do you want to pick up uh, and, and respond to that question? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Tom. Thanks, Rory. And thanks, Paul, for those questions. And just to say that Paul has played a hugely important role uh, in his engagement with the Rome-based agencies uh, in preparing for the Food Systems Summit. Essentially, uh, what this term game changer is, it's, it's an idea that uh, could become a priority under the Food Systems Summit, which, if implemented, could make a real difference. That's to put it as simply as possible. And there's a lot of different countries and different interests are uh, anxious and, and will be advocating for particular game changers to be uh, taken as the priority for the Food System Summit. Ireland is supporting two of them. The first one is this idea that countries who are going to adopt uh, a food systems approach in developing their agri-food agri strategies should get assistance. Now, Ireland is in a unique position here because we, that's, we have developed our food systems, our, our strategy using a food, we have developed our 2030 agri-food strategy using a food systems approach. That means, in essence, that we've fully acknowledged the interconnectedness between policies for food, for the environment, and for health. 
and to the best of my knowledge, we're the only country that has uh, developed a strategy in recent times using that basis. So we are in a very strong position, I think, to offer advice, counsel, and practical assistance uh, to, to, uh, to countries who want to go down that road. And I would say in particular, there's a particular interest in Africa in this regard. And we have already some good experience in, in working closely with Africa. And as Sinead says, it is not a matter of coming in and saying, this is the way to do it. No, it's a matter of coming in and saying, where are you starting from? What are your current circumstances and what are the, what are the, the sensible ways that uh, you should now begin to frame your future policy? And these are some of the Irish experiences which may be of some assistance to you. The second game changer is in the area of what's called wasting. Now, what, what is wasting? Wasting is essentially where children at a very young age have inadequate nutrition. And it, 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 it affects those children and it, it leaves them uh, in danger of death, basically. Uh, and uh, th th this is a serious problem. Nearly 50 million children in the world uh, suffer from wasting at the moment. And what we are saying in this game changer is that this is a problem at global level which needs a great deal more attention and priority. And Ireland wants to play a lead role in framing a, 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 a revised, a revived a, a commitment uh, to tackling this problem and making progress on it in the in the in the in the near future. Now, it is important to say that this is very consistent with long-term Irish intervention in this area. One of the big breakthroughs, nearly 20, nearly twenty years ago now, was when concern. Uh, uh, valid international, supported by Irish aid, came up with a new approach to dealing with a severe acute malnutrition. And that over a short period of time became accepted as international policy. And now the, re the reality is that uh, the, the uh, what's called CMAM, the Community Management of Acute Malnutrition. That's the standard practice used to deal with this issue. So there's a direct, if you like, lineage between the work that was done and accepted 15 to 20 years ago uh, with this commitment now to, to prioritizing wasting. And I do think that if we are going to any of these uh, meetings in, over the next uh, number of months, and indeed beyond. We need to go with a very clear agenda and a very clear voice. And for the, particularly for the Food System Summit, these two ideas about how you develop your food systems at, at a country level and how you give more priority to wasting, they are the two, the two of the big ideas that we are, we are going to, uh, to bring to the, to the Food System Summit. Sinead, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, Roy, just to add, I think Tom's idea of, of focusing on specifics is, is really important. I mean, the, the whole um, emphasis in this summit is that it's an inclusive summit, it's a people summit and, and so on. And I had the opposite experience 25 years ago, whereas, where I was a, a very junior part of, of the Irish team that, that negotiated the, the first uh, UN World Food Summit on behalf of the EU, uh, which was a, a, an experience in itself. And that was very much sitting in a room for 24 hours at a stretch, negotiating a communique. And that's not where we want to be these days, but I, I, it did have the virtue of having specifics written down. I suppose the danger with this inclusive approach is that it means what you, what everyone wants to interpret it as meaning. So I think Ireland having, having those at least two clear priorities for what we want to get out of the summit is really important and really helpful. Yeah, I mean, uh, if if it can be concrete, you know, uh, if we can get concrete progress out of this. Fantastic, and 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 too often diplomacy is is the statement and not and not not the actions that flow. Um, and I think, you know, certainly we see in the broader climate space, you know, there is a very big clock ticking, uh, and, we're, and we're, we need to respond. To it. And just picking that up, uh, that question of climate, Frank Convery, um, hi Frank. Uh, has asked uh, has asked us, you know, that a lot of the innovation and policy in greenhouse gas emissions reduction 
and removal is coming from indoor livestock systems, not grass fed. And that's clearly, you know, uh, you know, an issue for our model. And I know probably one of those really difficult questions in the in the food systems discussion that that, that you've been leading, Tom. I mean, I, you know, um, don't know if you want to add a comment to that, and maybe maybe if you could link it to to you know maybe Sean Farrell's question about the kind of the great greatest challenges to to getting global, sustainable, fair and resilient food systems, because it seems to me there's a link between sort of, you know, addressing greenhouse gases, you know, in one jurisdiction or or exporting and somewhere else dealing with, you know, maybe having a, a less a, a less climate sensitive way of, 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 of addressing agriculture, agricultural questions. But nonetheless, you know, um, so we offshore our carbon emissions if that makes sense. I'd be just interested in your thoughts, uh, particularly Tom, uh, uh, around the challenges, but also, you know, the, the way forward on, on those issues. Well, the first thing we have to do is get our own house in order. Um, I, I have a very simple principle that you should practice what you preach. There's no point in us advocating for things at international level unless we can point to our own domestic policy and say we, we, we are at least working in a particular direction. As Sinead says, we are not holding ourselves up as paragons of virtue in our current sta state, but we are committing to over the next decade, uh, working in a, a, a much more, working towards a sustainable food system. That's at the heart of what, what, what we're about. And uh, part of that is dealing with the environmental challenges that we have within our own agri-food sector. Then at the, at the international level, there are equally huge challenges that Frank is pointing to. Uh, but here, Ireland has the chance, and Frank is an expert in this, of per perhaps beginning to, to have new thinking about uh, emissions, have new technologies to deal with them. Uh, uh, there's a, an idea in our strategy, for example, that we should be working closely with New Zealand, both uh, livestock-based economies, both with common interests to get the world to think about the future uh, in, a, in a more, I would say, in a more sensible way. So we have challenges, undoubtedly, but I think we have the framework in our 2030 strategy to, to address those challenges. And I mean, part of this then connects to your point about e ecosystems, Rory. I mean, Ireland actually, in terms of an ecosystem for developing sustainable food systems, is in a good place. And if we can establish our reputation, genuine reputation based on our performance as a real leader in this uh, sustain, in the sustainable food system space, this is going to lead to a new generation of exports for Ireland. We're not just going to be producing food, we're going to be, produ we're going to be producing the services and the ideas which enable sustainable food to be produced. So that is an area, and that if you look at our own, how we have evolved as a country over the, the last 30 to 50 years from essentially producing relatively straightforward uh, anim animal products, uh, commodity products, to the sophisticated food sector we have today, exporting to 180 countries across the world, to the next generation, which is going to bring in the issue of services to a much greater degree. That's the trajectory that we're on, and I think we are very well capable of delivery, delivering it. I might maybe sort of ask you to pick up on that point, Sinead, and maybe I'm bringing in two questions here that, 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 that are on the, the slide, of one from Neil Gannon, about how can we best engage with the private sector to encourage their participation in a contribution to sustainable food systems approach? And I think Tom has begun to map out how that might happen, and Chris Melia uh, has, has kind of also asked us, you know, is food diplomacy possible to achieve a meaningful level considering current industry practices and uh, the weight of lobbying influence? So, I mean, I'd be interested, you know, from, from uh, your department's perspective, I suppose, how, how you see how the, the process of translating, you know, the vision that, that Tom is articulating into, into practice and, in the, and your dialogue with, with, with business. Thanks, Rory. Uh, th that's a very easy question. Um, <laughs> I suppose, just to go back to, to Frank's point on, on grass-fed, I suppose grass-fed livestock production is uh, 
probably the most efficient in the world per, per unit of output. But obviously, that's not sufficient uh, in that we need to focus on total emissions from agriculture. And because agriculture accounts for a third of our, our total greenhouse gas emissions, because we don't have other major industries, then we need to focus on, on driving down that total emissions. And that's a serious challenge for the sector. And I suppose it's a, sec it's a, a challenge that, that we need to bring to our international conversations as well and see how we can help uh, both ourselves to improve and other countries to improve in terms of, of driving down global emissions. Um, in terms of engaging with the private sector, I think there is, in, in a domestic sense, in terms of Irish agribusiness, I think there is a significant awareness, particularly around those challenges on the environment, that what the, the international trade customer is demanding is increasingly is proof of sustainability. Uh, proof of environmental sustainability, but also proof of sustainability along the chain. What, what works really well in talking to international trade customers is to bring them to Ireland, demonstrate our systems, show them the farms and families that produce that food. And if they can't be satisfied that those, that those systems are sustainable and that Ireland's reputation, which is demonstrated through Origin Green, is really strongly based on fact that we're not in a good place. So I think there is an ambition there from the private sector to grapple with those changes because they see that that is a source of competitive advantage for the future. It's not easily done, but I think the process we've had, uh, chaired by Tom, in the, in the 2030 um, Agri-Food Committee has really uh, not got a consensus, but certainly got engagement from all of the different players in Ireland that environment is something we need to, to address in order to be credible for the future. Um, in terms of the question about, about uh, current industry practices, again, I, I, would, um, I, I would go back to, to, to what I've just said, that, that really increasingly both Irish agri-food firms who are in many cases multinationals and multinational food firms are seeing the, the market return from sustainability in all its forms. Yeah, I mean, and I think, I mean, it goes back to that issue around, around integration as well. I mean, the EU's new green deal is, is you know, is, is pushing up the cost of capital for less sustainable business models. And so banks, you know, bankers, the bond markets themselves are asking these questions of, of, of businesses in ways that were probably unthinkable about, about a decade ago. So the whole, the broader ecosystem, you know, the, of capitalism is moving, which will have its own push factor on business as well. Um, I kind of want to bring together maybe two questions, one from Leslie Nivrian, um, who's our ambassador in Sierra Leone, and she asks, or she, she observes that many of our partner countries uh, in Africa, and indeed probably elsewhere, are too poorly prepared or lack capacity uh, to engage with the food system somewhat, and she asks, you know, is there, are there ways in which we might be able to support them? And, 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 and Tom, specifically, do you see a role for yourself in that? And, and I think maybe a question, and I might ask this of myself after maybe Tom has responded, you know, but how we might maybe pick up, but Sinead, it would be interesting in your observations as well, you know, how the national agri-food strategy, when it's adop adopted, might be integrated into, you know, into the kind of strategies that we have for engagement with, with partner countries in in, in, in least developed countries, and maybe that might pick up some of the work, you know, for the, you know, uh, for for the um, the committee that we're about to establish. But um, maybe Tom first, um, you know, I mean, how do we how do we really support you know LDCs going to the summit, and then maybe Sinead and myself then afterwards about how do we integrate the evolving strategy uh, into into our work uh, as an aid program. Um, sorry, Tom, your mic needs. To, in answering uh, Rory, I want to come back to the word, uh, Sinead's word earlier on of integration. Um, I had the pleasure of, of chairing for the European Commission a task force on rural Africa, um, which reported in 2019. Um, the, one of the, the central uh, messages from that uh, report is that, you know, the fact that Africa over the next 30 years is going to be the fastest growing part of the world in terms of population growth. 
uh, it's going, population is going to double effectively in Africa over the next uh, 30 years. They have a huge developmental challenges facing them. Uh, but at the heart, if, they're, if, they are, if African countries are to embark on economic development, they actually have to start with their agri-food sectors. So a central recommendation of our report in the Task Force Rural Africa was that the, the priority that needs to be given to the, the development, the sustainable development of their agri-food se sectors. And we recommended that in terms of European African uh, collaboration into the future, that should be a central message of a central part of that collaboration. Now, one of the things in the first half of next year is a major summit between Africa and Europe uh, at which they will approve a comprehensive framework for their future relationship. And we are suggesting in our report, and I would su suggest that it needs to be a central message for Irish foreign policy, that the African agri-food development for Africa in partnership with Europe has to be a central part of it. Now, that comes directly into Leslie's uh, comment. Leslie is absolutely right that most African countries, from a capacity point of view, and indeed from a currently a political point of view, are not sufficiently focused on uh, their development strategy and particularly the role that the agri-food sector should be playing. So uh, I think that needs to change. I think it can change via the Irish Development Cooperation Programme. And insofar as I can play a role as special envoy, uh, and I did live for three years in Africa and have worked with, uh, around Africa for the, much of the last 40 years, I would be very delighted to, uh, to, to play a role. And I look forward, I, we have a call scheduled on, on Thursday uh, between Irish Aid, uh, myself and Leslie in Sierra Leone, uh, to see how we can respond to a, re a request from the Vice President of Sierra Leone for some assistance in framing their own uh, uh, agri-food development strategy. So that's something I look forward very much to talking to you, Leslie, on Thursday afternoon. Just to add to that, Rory, I suppose we have uh, some small examples of, of cooperation already in, in this space. So. Uh, myself and, and several colleagues on, on the call today would have participated in a, an FAO conference in Kigali in 2019, where we looked at the Irish experience of strategy development with a number of, of um, civil servants from partner countries in Africa to see what lessons were applicable. And it was very striking to me the, the, the issues that were, resonated best were the issues where we were identifying problems in our own systems. And they could identify with those problems and say, how are how is it possible that only 10 percent of, of farmers in Ireland are women? Uh, those kind of things, you know, that, that we're not again, we're not presenting ourselves as having all the answers. We're working together on shared problems. And I think that approach is something that that could be developed further and might be useful for the future. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a very powerful exchange and, and I recall around that time also there was a, a delegation visited Ireland um, and included I think they visited some small farms and I mentioned that because Lorraine Cook has asked about small farms and I think it's one of the interesting things about about our model is that that we've managed to get scale while, while also uh, while also keeping at least for now relatively small small family farm structure and I think that's that's interesting um, and I think it picks up also that question about what can we do in terms of, of integrating this into our mission strategy, food diplomacy to our mission strategies. You know, I, I think there's things about the you know how we move to scale in Ireland while maintaining structures that that that, that are relatively traditional uh, it, it is interesting, uh, and I think we've seen that at, in various places. And I think you know certainly the support that 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 Chagas and um, you know, um, Sustainable Food Systems Ireland give as well our, our doorways uh, to, to enable some of the, these techniques to be to be captured, acknowledging that we have to be respectful on on the their primary mandates. Um, but I think I think there's more that we can we can do cleverly uh, there. I mean, Therese Healy has asked a question, which is the most popular question of the lot, uh, around um, you know any thought given to having an exchange of staff between our two departments. 
uh, till our skills and knowledge exchange. Um, and we, I mean, that's something that 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 Sinead and I have discussed. Uh, we haven't bottomed it out. I, I think it's fair to say, um, but I think it's something which you know, in principle, yes, I, I think we'd be very open to. Um, but all departments are always looking for staff, so you know, it's in that context of 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 of, 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 of priorities. But I think. I think, and it picks up your point, Sinead, about integration. I think if we're serious about integration, these kinds of exchanges uh, are probably things that all departments are going to have to do more of in the, in the years ahead, and we just have to build it into our, into our business plans. So I'm afraid you're getting St. Augustus's answer to raise yes, but not yet. Uh, it's probably where we are, to be fair, but I, I, I suspect it's something we probably have to action in the near future, you know, whatever near is in civil service time. Um, We've had an hour's conversation. I said we'd be an hour. Uh, I think this could go on longer, um, and that's always a sign of, of a rich discussion. Um, um, I'm not going to try and draw conclusions because I, I think, actually, I, I'd rather the conversation continued where people are or virtually uh, afterwards. Um, and, I, and I think, as, you know, certainly as Tom's comments about engaging with, with the embassy in Sierra Leone, indicate the conversations are continuing anyway in various forums. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to, to Tom and to Sinead for your time um, uh, today, but also your time more generally, because uh, we talk, the three of us, on a regular basis, and, and I know, Sinead, just how much work uh, you, you and your team do in the, in, in the broader international space and how much support you are uh, to, to the team here in Irish Aid, just to say thank you for that as well as for your time today. It really is appreciated. Um, and, and, I, and I think we'll see the fruit of that with, with the concrete things that Ireland is going to bring to the food system somewhat uh, in September and hopefully um, some really good outcomes from that. And Tom, thanks to you too. I mean, I think your energy uh, you know, uh, and vision helps drive that collaboration uh, between our two departments. It's, it's, you, know, um, you know, in some senses, you're like the bee that pollinates both of us. Uh, 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 and bees are very important uh, to food systems, as we know. Um, and you know, uh, and I think also you're you're also good about acting as our conscience, uh, bringing you know the memory of, of promises passed back to the table and say live up to the things that your predecessors said they would do, and holding us to it. Um, and, and I think that's really important. Uh, and and I think the energy that you bring in terms of getting those concrete deliverables to to the food system summit and. In, in, in September and also to the Nutrition for Growth Summit and beyond uh, in, in December, I think will be really important as well. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you both in, in real life uh, very soon. And thanks to everybody else uh, for joining us today and for your participation and your questions. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed Sinead and, and Tom's insights as much as I did. Thank you very much. See you all soon.